Welcome to our channel, Behind My Story. Please like, share, and subscribe. Drastic and dire situations create heroes. No one makes history unless their story is inspiring or involves great pain and suffering, overcoming many obstacles and hardships. No one achieves glory without believing in themselves and their abilities. Or at least, that's what I think. Sometimes your path to making history doesn't quite go according to plan. My story is a great example. I'm Joanna. I'm 21 years old. I live with my parents and my little sister, Veronica. My father was a police officer. He was very brave. He was my idol. He believed in justice and sacrificed anything to see it done. One of my life goals was to be like him. I love to see him in his uniform. I viewed him as a hero of sorts and believed the old adage that good always triumphs over evil. Unfortunately, that rosy affirmation doesn't always hold true in real life. My father's work used to keep him terribly busy. Nevertheless, he took a few hours off on Veronica's birthday so he could be there with us. Halfway through the party, Dad's work called and told him that a thug was holding a group of nursery kids hostages, demanding a large sum of money and a means to escape the scene. Dad had to leave to deal with the situation, so he excused himself, telling us that duty calls. We were used to seeing Dad dash off suddenly at various times to deal with crimes in progress, but something felt uneasy about that particular time. Dad arrived at the scene, just when his colleagues were preparing to charge into the building at significant risk to the kids. Dad volunteered to enter alone to take out the criminal before anyone got hurt. He sneaked into the building and engaged the hostage taker in a gunfight. He managed to kill the thug but was seriously wounded. He died days later. The whole police department and the city were saddened by his loss. They held a memorial service for Dad. This senseless crime and the loss of my dad galvanized me to enroll in the police academy. Mom tried her best to dissuade me, but I refused to budge. I passed the entrance exam and worked my way through it. It was a challenging program that required diligence, persistence, and patience. The training was quite difficult at first, with very few breaks, and everyone else was intelligent and competitive. In fact, I began to doubt if I could keep up with them. But then I dreamed of Dad hugging me and telling me that I was his hero and that he would always be at my side. When I woke up the next morning, I felt somehow different, more confident, more resolved to succeed. I worked even harder, and my instructors noticed and acknowledged my extra effort. I made friends, who soon gained confidence in my abilities. My grades improved considerably. Graduation day came, and I anxiously waited to see what my first assignment would be. I was ready to tackle crime, to fight for justice, for all. Unfortunately, my first assignment was as a traffic cop. I was disheartened to see my peers get more prestigious positions, even though I had higher grades than they did. Dejected, I went home and told my mom. She encouraged me and told me that everyone had a job to do and should do it to the best of their ability. Rewards would come in time. She said she appreciated the work of traffic cops, who kept city traffic flowing smoothly during accidents and other abnormal situations. Her words helped me to accept my situation. Regardless, the work was boring, and I still envied my peers for their more important and more glamorous assignments. Life's just not fair. But remember those dire situations I mentioned earlier? Well, during one of my traffic control days, when a traffic light had failed, I noticed two black cars idling in front of a bank in a no-parking zone. Initially, I thought it was the bank manager or some other VIP stepping into the bank for a quick stop. I turned my attention back to my traffic control and waved the cars waiting in the left turn lane to proceed to turn left. Then, I looked back at the bank and noticed that a man had gotten out of one of the black cars and stepped over to speak with the bank guard, standing outside the bank. Suddenly, he struck the guard and knocked him unconscious. Then the cars emptied as a group of masked men exited and rushed into the bank. These actions all occurred in quick succession. An armed robbery was in progress. I called the police station on my radio and reported the incident. The police quickly showed up and took the waiting car drivers into custody. The masked men had no choice but to remain inside the bank with the customers as hostages. They were trapped. 
They threatened that if they weren't let go free with the money, they would blow up the bank and kill all the hostages. My father's life and death scene played across my mind like a movie rerun. I watched the policemen discussing what to do. I felt that I knew more about these city blocks than they did, because I spent many hours every day plying these streets, directing traffic. So I volunteered to enter the bank alone. Since this was my beat, I knew that the bank had a secret entrance that the criminals couldn't have known anything about. Thanks to my police training, I was able to easily pick the lock on the secret door and sneak in through the back. I saw two hallways, one to the left and one to the right. I decided to take the one on the left. I expected that the right one would lead me to the lobby where the criminals were holding the hostages. As I moved stealthily, I heard a noise and discovered that I had reached the lobby instead. There were four masked men watching the hostages who had been tied up. Then, I spied a bomb in the midst of the hostages. These guys were definitely serious. One of the hostages spotted me, and I gestured to him not to speak or look at me. Unfortunately, one of the thugs had already noticed the hostage looking in my direction. He looked over and saw me. I fired and hit him in the shoulder. I knew the shot would cause the other policemen to rush in, so I needed to distract the masked man quickly. One criminal was holding a hostage in front of him, and he told me he would kill her if I didn't put my gun down. I lowered my gun to the floor, stood up, and raised my hands. All the masked men were watching me, with their backs to the main entrance. Just as I was about to get shot, the police squad rushed in and told them to freeze. The thugs surrendered. The hostages thanked me, and the police chief thanked me for risking my life for the hostages. The next day, the governor called me into his office and praised my bravery and dedication. He surprised me by transferring me from the traffic control division to the crime prevention division. I felt my father's spirit watching me at that moment and smiling with pride. My friends began calling me the Girl of Steel, and I was perfectly okay with that. In legends and horror stories, ghosts are typically spirits of the dead, those who suffered greatly in their lives, that when their time comes, they choose to linger in this world, to sow hatred and chaos among the living. Do you believe this, that there are vengeful spirits living among us, right here, right now? I do, and my story will tell you why. I'm Martha. I'm 19 years old, and I have a twin sister, Caroline. She wasn't just my sister, but we were best friends and subsequent partners in crime. We suffered a miserable life because we lived in poverty. Our parents were very poor, despite belonging to a rich family. Grandpa, on my dad's side of the family, worked in the petroleum industry, where he made lots of investments and projects. And fortunately, he had a lot of enemies too, many of whom were from mom's side of the family. Dad was the middle son, but he assumed responsibility for Grandpa's work because he was very competent and capable. Similarly, Mom became responsible for her father's work. She did her best to avoid conflict between her side of the family and Dad's side so that they could work together peacefully. It was at this point, I believe, that vengeful spirits must have come into play. My parents had loved each other since their childhood, but they didn't tell their families about it. In the past, both my grandpas were once friends and partners. They worked together within the same company, but they later became enemies and split the company into two. Both families hated each other that day forth, all of them except for my parents. Mom's uncles took over her company and fired her. Dad couldn't bear to see Mom in this situation, so he told his dad that he was going to marry her. So his father made him choose between my mother and the company with all the power and wealth that came with it. To Grandpa's chagrin, Dad chose Mom over everything else. And so, they got married and lived together with Grandma. They faced life's problems without any support from anyone. Grandpa felt betrayed by Dad and disowned him. Then, Carolyn and I were born. Dad did his best to make us happy and give us everything we needed. Grandma told us about our family's history and how both our parents had been cut off from their families out of sheer greed and betrayal. It felt a bit unfair, but this was our life now. Then, one day, we heard Dad speaking on the phone, with Mom standing beside him, and they were both acting very nervous. He told her to take care of us, and then he left the house and never came back. Mom never told us where he went or why he left. Sometime after that, Grandma passed away. 
Our situation was getting worse. We thought we had to do something to help Mom. Maybe we were being influenced by those vengeful spirits I mentioned. But either way, Carolyn and I made our decision to go over to the dark side. We decided to steal, rob, defraud. We were smart enough. Together, we could definitely pull it off. We began with our neighbor, very wealthy, but very cheap. We figured she must be keeping her money somewhere in the house, since she didn't believe in leaving a dime in the bank's care and was completely convinced that they would steal her money. Lucky for us, I guess. And we were right. We infiltrated her house when she was away and found a load of money stashed away under a loose tile on the floor. Took some time to find, but we got it. When we got home, the house was completely deserted. Mom wasn't there. Her clothes were all gone from the wardrobe. We were on our own now. We began exploiting jewelry shop owners. We would pretend to be a wealthy customer and tell the owner that we wanted to take the jewelry home to show our mom and get her opinion. We would drug hotel owners and put all the money in their safe into a bag, then scream and call for help, saying that the owner had just collapsed, creating a diversion and disappearing in the crowd. We were getting quite good at it. Our wealth slowly grew day by day. Mom called every now and then to check that we were fine on our own. Of course, she knew nothing about our work or what we were doing to survive. Our ultimate goal was to earn a lot of money and run away to another country to start a new life. One evening, I was with my friends and I met a guy named Craig. He was rich, but somehow seemed different than all the people we robbed. Later I found out, to my surprise, that he was our cousin, the grandson of the man that had taken everything away from my mother and fired her. Unsure of what to do, I told Carolyn what I knew. She went ecstatic. She told me that this was our chance to take back everything, the company, the money that belonged to us. But for the first time, we didn't quite agree. Craig was nothing like his father. He wasn't greedy. He was kind and gentle. He often told me that money was a curse if it meant living alone away from people that we care about and cherish. I made up my mind, and I told Carolyn that I couldn't be a part of our evil scheming anymore, and I wanted out, and so I left her and went to live on my own. At this point, I had no idea what Carolyn was up to. In the meantime, Craig was negotiating a deal that would earn his company a lot of profit. He told me to come visit at the company, and then we would go out for dinner. I accepted happily. When I arrived at his company... I sensed someone behind me. Then, suddenly a hand pressed a handkerchief over my mouth, and I passed out. When I woke up, I found Craig unconscious beside me. To the side, I could see his safe was wide open. Papers were scattered everywhere, and in my hand was the key to the safe. Then the police arrived, found the safe key in my hand, and accused me of being a thief. I told them that I had been drugged unconscious, just like Craig. The police officer looked inside my bag and found a bottle of chloroform. I was shocked, to say the least. I couldn't understand what had happened. They took me downstairs and tried to wake up Craig. At about that time, a woman in a black wig came over to me and said, Martha, you betrayed me. It was Carolyn. I couldn't believe that she framed me. Then she left. Her betrayal hurt me deeply. A part of my brain told me, that I had betrayed her first, but that doesn't matter now. When I get out of prison, someday, I resolve to get my revenge on her. We were no longer sisters. Just as we had been betrayed by our families before us, we were now locked into yet another circle of family betrayal. Only it was more personal and closer to home this time. Were they truly vengeful spirits influencing us? I think so. What about you?